All right. Strong. Yeah. Let's talk about disruptive minds. Yeah. You want to tell people how we came up with that name? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, the best I could do would be just saying we were sitting at the LT Corner Pub and trying to iterate on what would summarize what we're talking about mm. in these discussions. Pub Friday, how we're talking. Yeah. And Pub Friday is it's a good time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so let's get you talking for a minute. What does disruptive minds mean to you? What is the disruptive mind? Why does it matter? Cliche first is challenging the status quo. Not taking things at surface value. Not accepting that just because the things are the way they are is how they should be or how they could be or even when that's for us. Um, looking not even for better answers, but looking for more real answers to things. Because sometimes the real part is actually less good than how we perceive it to be. Because, um, you know, people seem to make things up to make themselves look better. Yeah. Accepting reality for what it is. Uh huh. Yeah. So, in a world, I said this last week and say it for camera now, but part of the American dream is delusion. Like, if you bring a dream into reality, well, if you live in your dreams in reality, you're delusional. Now, if you can bring your dreams into reality, that's, that's a goal. That's Are you disruptive? Is that world. being disruptive? A lot of times it's disruptive. Yeah, sure. Um, but so part of the American dream is where we live in delusion. We're also allowed to live in delusion. Like you can have your freedom. You can say your crazy things. You can exist in a very different way than most of the people around you are living. And what was I even trying to get to there? We're talking disruptive minds here. Yeah. So um, a disruptive mind, whenever... You have a mass of delusion and dreams that aren't currently reality and people that are living in the dream that's not their reality right now. It's like disruption is kind of sad. It's like almost red pill a little bit, you know, got the whole red pill, blue pill from the matrix. Um, you know what I've always been curious about? You got the red pill matrix, right? That comparison a lot of people use. We're in the matrix, wake up to what's real, what's reality. Yeah. Is it possible for the disruptive mind to also be living in a dream, just a different one? Yeah. Do you think that's a bad thing? I, I think that's the power of free of a choice. I mean, mm. that's part of the gift is, I mean, red pill or blue pill, the reality you live in, you have to pick a pill. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. That's very fair. Um, so. I love it. I think, um, something you were hinting at that what disruptive mind means to me. And we have to admit, this could all be our own delusion, yeah. right? Our delusion could be the not right delusion. Mm. The common delusion is that those whom have a fancy degree, um, those whom have a fancy job, those whom have money deserve respect on account of those factors. Right. So the disruptive mind to me is the mind of irreverence. We've gone back to that. Right. It's the mind yeah. of irreverence, the, the irreverence, the not showing respect for things that typically show people show respect for. It, right. I don't respect you because you have Ph.D. I don't respect you because you've built a business and sold it. I respect you if I think that you are practical and wise and make appropriate decisions. I think too many people, I mean, there's a few delusions, right? The first delusion is people think PhD means that you're smarter than them. The second delusion means that you have a bunch of money means you're smarter than them. And people confuse money with intelligence all the time, <laughs> all the time. Mm. So I think our, our, disrupting, our disruption is looking at that and saying, that's not as real as you think it is. Yeah, what you said was... <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that's a, I, you know, we could dive into this a little bit. Um, the, 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 go ahead. What do you got? I want to preface like in all these conversations, one of my hopes 
and I think a goal or at least a consequential one of putting these out is that we will get like visceral, like raw, like feedback on our level of delusion. Yeah. Are we delusional? Yeah. That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. Because we could be, right? You got to put yourself out there to be, to be, to be raw. Mm -hmm. Like how often do we ask people like, what does it look like I'm doing? Um, am I crazy? Like, I don't know. Nobody ever asks me those questions about themselves. And very rarely do I ask other people those questions to myself. So I'm just like, you know, huh. like, is that protection? Oh. Is it, we don't have people we can trust to live like giving us feedback into our lives. Either way, or whatever the case, I feel like it's a problem. It might be another delusion of looking for yes men, right? Everybody's looking for people to agree with them. Nobody's looking for the people to disagree and tell them where they're wrong. Echo chamber, like yep. I just get in a feedback loop and mm. feel good. Mm. That's good. Yeah, I would love feedback on mm. where we're wrong. Yeah. Um, so what I think would be interesting to go into is our our origin stories for irreverence, right? Yeah. So what makes you? We've already talked about this. I know you're an irreverent person. Mm -hmm. What makes you irreverent and and a disruptive mind? How did you how did you grow into that? keep it quick um well we got to keep it quick this is big this is this is the pod this sets the toe okay um tell us about tell us about work your work life back in the day as an employee i'll give you the first story that was told to me about something i did okay when i was a little kid my father and his like right hand man handyman were working on a trailer or something and they were trying to use these, like one set of tools to move these bolts this way. I was like four. Apparently I went over and like gave them a different tool and was like, you know, boom, dad, do this. And which from an infant, like they had given me like these little kid tool sets. So like I was familiar, my dad was in construction. So like I was a big construction worker. Yeah. Um, and I was, that story was repeated to me when I was seven or eight, I remember. And, and then I was like, wait, aren't they like grown people? Like they, they should know how to use tools better than me, right? You would think so. So that, that was like- the Because they're grown ups, right? There's the irreverence, they're grown ups, So they know. So that was the seed. Um, when I was younger, honestly, then I would text. I would like put myself in situations to see if like people were really like perceptive or like would really Man, we're gonna get we're just gonna jump into it quick so one another one was i used to hide in places i thought were semi-obvious whenever my parents would come home and then see if they would notice me so one time i just hid outside and i just sat right next to a barrel and i wasn't covered in any way it was just kind of dark outside and they just walked right by me so I'm like oh man so that kind of you know challenged my perception of like how perceptive we are in the world. Like how much are we really fairly I want? Um, they, they just walked right by me, like three foot away from me. No idea. Um, huh. This is stuff as a kid. And then, okay, let's we'll skip to the more work stuff. I'm, those are like more like seeds. That's areas. good. Those are big seeds. Um, You're looking at people, they're lost in their head, right? Yeah. There's, they're not, I mean, maybe you wouldn't even call them delusional at that point, but how often are we so in our head that we're missing yeah. What's it? What's that? What's it around us? On the other side, it could even be just we have a finite amount of attention and focus that we can provide. Yeah. And if we did spend all of our time thinking about what is around me that's going to kill me, we would probably get nothing done. We'd have super high cortisol and we'd probably die really early. Honestly. Probably. We'd probably die sooner because we're only paying attention to those things. Mm -hmm. um, so then fast forward to work. I worked in an insurance over settlement mitigation company, which is a very fancy word to say, we make sure that insurance companies are only paying out the right of what they need to, the yeah. claims. And along that, I, there were, it was overall a great experience. They're still a great company, they're a big company, liked all the people I worked with. Mm -hmm. It was more the process of some of the things I was put in a position to do, or I was required to do for my job, that I was like, I don't agree with this, like morally or ethically, that, well, yeah, was that, 
I actually don't know if those challenges are like are made any more reverent. Um, it was more just things I thought were hard. That I was like, I don't want to do this. I think. Yeah. Where I had to talk to people about like, oh, your dogs burned up in a home fire. I'm not gonna replace those. I can't do any money for that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's like. Mm. Yeah. Good. Maybe you learned how to rationalize things that you disagreed with because you had incentives to. I think you learned irreverence there. I, if I put myself in that position, the irreverence becomes maybe everybody's not as honest and truth seeking as they present to be mm -hmm. or fair. Yeah. So it was a big demonstration of yeah, fairness is not the game of the world. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's, you know, it's just the rules yep. and the rules aren't fair. It's like the rules are just the rules and they set precedents for mm -hmm. one for bales. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's fast forward to the big chunk of irreverence development in my life. Yeah. Working for a software company, um, which in hindsight, a lot of those people were definitely very gracious to me and like they were nice to me and like they were great and but they're a company they had to do. but the company itself and the companies we interacted with is where i saw like Ugh, whoa okay um you know interestingly enough to get hired into that position uh the guy that ended up getting me in there he was like you, know, you have to have a master's degree you have to have like four to six years of experience and I was like, I have no degree and I have about 11 months of experience of working in any sort of corporate environment. It was like, but you're good. You got it. Mm. Mm. I was like, what does that mean? Do I need to be certified or do is my qualification happen different than my certification? Yeah. Like, that's not a piece true. of paper that makes me qualified. Is it really something else? When a lot of people think that the piece of paper is what makes you qualified. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, could I potentially like heal somebody that's sick by like guiding them in the right direction for like health or whatever? Potentially. Yeah. I'd get a felony though because I'm practicing medicine without a license because I don't have that piece of paper. It's true. But anyway, so, uh, so he gets me in the job. I was just tech guy, just doing the tech stuff. And um, eventually I made it to sales and then into consulting. And around that time, I was traveling around the world sitting across the table from people that manage billion dollar p ls you know managing tens of thousands of people and talking about what is wrong in their position what they think with all their employees what's happening and how they're not using software well or how they are and how it is going and it just i felt like i was talking to myself across the table half the time it's not great because i don't think i'm very smart. I'm not very smart. Like I don't have that sort of formal education to manage those kind of things. But I was looking and I was like, there's some things obviously wrong here that somehow no one's paying attention to. Like if I go inside of a multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 company and they're like, yeah, we use about 40% of the software that we currently purchase every year. I'm like, why? And they're like, oh, there's no one. No. People don't like to use it. What are you doing? Yeah. Crazy. Or if you make like essential transportation equipment for the world. And you're like, yeah, we can't keep track of 30% of our tools at any time. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I want to get on those things. Yeah. And like it happened everywhere. And then there was places like in the energy sector where they have me as be like almost this scapegoat. Cause I'm describing how software works to people that know nothing about software. And I'm just using these very Vague, called vague, primitive, like slides and stuff that were approved. They went, we went through a whole internal approval process and then we go into the companies yeah. and then we work with like their leadership to make sure like it's good with them for me to go say those things to their customers. Yeah. And their customers just eat it up. And I'm like, I, it, it was, it was like security arbitrage. I don't know. Like it was this weird. No irreverence. They just believe. Yeah. They, they just believe. And because their job was to believe in it. Yeah. Like it's like the people sitting across the table from me were incentivized to do something faster or spend less money. And I was telling them that they could do it. And so they were like, well, we believe you. They're like, I don't quite understand it, but yeah, I believe it. I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna pay yeah. for it. And I was like, wow, that tore my mind apart. Really? Yeah. Um, all the authority structure I had built in and 
all of the things I respected and I felt bad about like not doing in my life, like not finishing college was all of a sudden just like blown apart. Basically. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and I'd say the, oh man, it all kind of came to a, a head when I was sitting at a bar in Washington, DC with this genius of a guy, like certified genius and like qualified genius. So, yeah. Um, and, but him and I ended up in the same company with the same title and in the same bar talking to each other. Kurt, I had no reason why. I really don't like it. Like mm. earlier that day, I've been sitting there telling them, I was like, I don't know why I'm at this table with you guys. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Like there's no logic. There's no rationale. There's nothing you could write on paper that be like, yeah, A plus B plus C equals Dylan sitting here. Yeah. And he was like, man, I, it's like, I applaud you for, you know, he was like, you have had none of this life prescribed to you and you still found it. And he's yeah. like me. He's like, my parents told me where I was getting married. Like they signed off on a woman I'm going to marry. He's like, they told me what industry I was going to go into, mm-hmm. what schools I was allowed to go to. And I did all oh, those yeah. things and I made it right here where you you got none, found your way. none of that and you're, we're in the same spot. Yeah. And I was like, dang. Now, mind you, this was a Jewish guy talking to a Christian guy, which I thought was kind of interesting. That is interesting. It was like pouring good things into me. And I was like, oh, dude, yeah. Yeah. I'll take it for sure. Uh, Wow. But yeah, so I just broke a world apart, um, found a way to separate from the company gracefully. Yeah. Semi gracefully, at least. Um, Been looking for, you know, what's the, where's the real stuff? So many, or what is the right way to operate? in that space like mm-hmm. like if uh if i can't unsee those experiences no it's the big challenge now so whether i'm delusional or not i either have to find a way to address and manage the delusion or i have to find a way to work with the delusion that's out there and mm-hmm. either way it's hard playing their game is tough mm. playing on their field of delusion is tough yeah absolutely so getting out of it makes sense Man, there's so many things in that that I think of. The first is, right, the first thing I thought of was the world is full of mechanics with broken taillights. It makes no sense, yeah. right? It, mm-hmm. This is absolutely stupid. Um, the second is, and this is just a point of note, for our lingo moving forward, I've said this before, I no longer, it is no longer a compliment for me to say someone is super smart. I say they're practical. There's a difference. There's a fundamental difference, right? There is a guy who you're describing at the bar who's very, very book smart and did everything right, right? Did it all right by the book in theory. But you, you were just practical, right? That's that's what caught you up. You were just practical. And you're a practical guy, right? You build things without much training. You just go build them, right? You set up studios like this without much training. You just go do it. Like, that's, uh, there's... There's a compliment in being practical that people don't think about because you get rewarded for being smart. Um, and then that, that leads to Steve Jobs, the quote that men, I think that, that there's a quote from Steve Jobs that really made me, all of these things had seeds, right? That, that I, I have a lot of experiences with, with seeds being planted, but it really sprouted when I heard the Steve Jobs quote, which is, um, ah, shoot, man, I don't even remember how it started. Something about your whole perspective changes when you realize the world was built by people no smarter than you are. And that's, that's where, that is the disruptive mind. Whenever you can look around and say, that person doesn't demand my respect because they have PhD, they demand my respect or not because they're practical and know how to navigate the world in a way. Um, a way that's more human, I think, too, right? People get lost in the logic and lost in the spreadsheets and lost in the numbers. And they never, ever think, I'm dealing with people. What are people like? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, man, my thing, I think I, I really plant my seed with the disruptive mind. And this is one that gets me all the time. I, there are two things that people say about me. One of them I like, one of them I don't. Okay. P- 
people will say, I'm very calm or very peaceful. And I love that. That is like, I want to be known as being that guy that's calm and peaceful. I am not aggressive in any way. I don't know why, one born with it. Mm. Not competitive, not aggressive. Um, or people say I'm really, really smart. And that gets me every time. I, I don't like it. And it's usually the people, it's usually the people that know that I study astrophysics in school, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think my biggest seed, the biggest, the biggest seed that dropped for the disruptive mind was graduating with a degree that sounds really, really fancy to everybody else and knowing that it wasn't that hard. Um, and I tell people, I say, I'm not that smart. I just was willing to dedicate to it. Mm -hmm. I just was willing to work at it. I liked it and I dedicated to it. And it wasn't that hard, right? And everybody looks at it and they go, oh man, wow. It is it too low? I have, I have, that's where my irreverence started. I looked around at everybody and I was like, you guys think you're smart because we just, because, because we just answered some, some numbers on a board. Are you serious? Mm. No, I don't know anything. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Um, the willing to dedicate the time to it. I just heard this morning, extraordinary is just doing extra of the ordinary. Like, oh, blah, blah. yeah, it's obvious. It's in the words, but oh. yeah. Here's so, yeah, dedicating to do the work. Here is a practical skill mm. that I heard about today that I've heard about before. I think uh, Mark Cuban is the one who really started it because it's how Mark Cuban made money. I'm not going to use the word, but it's RTFM. Read the freaking manual. Mm. That's it. So many people in this, that's practical. Right, so many people in the world, they get something new, fancy, and shiny. And they go, oh, I just spent all this money on this new, fancy, shiny thing. This is awesome, I love it. And then they go hire somebody else to use it for them, or they don't use it at all, or whatever, because they don't understand it. And all of the answers are in the freaking manual. Read the, if you read the freaking manual, that's the practical wisdom, putting in the work. That's it. We're gonna go back to reading the manual. Yeah. but. When you say astrophysics wasn't hard. Yeah. So it's pretty hard to grasp, but I, every time you say it. <laughs> <I know. laughs> I'm, I'm still like, I'm like, that's one of those things that I'm still like, I don't know. Like, yeah. at this point, I'm not willing to put in the time to see how hard it is. Exactly. But at the same time, maybe that's what it is. It is. Um, it is. You like, got to be passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, that's the veil they try to paint though. That's the delusion. The mm -hmm. veil that they try to paint over everything is like, and it starts when you're young, man. I mean, I got through it because my parents, my whole life were like, you're smarter than this. You can do better than this. You're smarter than this. You're way smarter. What are you doing? You're being an idiot. Be smarter. Mm -hmm. Right. I always got encouraged. Um, I think there are people that go through life who are not always getting encouraged. And so when the world tells them, Oh, that's too hard. You shouldn't do that. That's way too difficult. Or yeah, that's for the smart people. Don't don't touch that one. They believe them, mm. you know. And that's that's being young and naive, I think. But I can tell you that the physicists that I interact with would sit here today and say the exact same thing if they weren't on camera. If they weren't on camera, right? When you're on camera, you're incentivized to promote the things you've done and make it seem like what you've done is something that other people can't do. But the world was built by people who are no smarter than you are. And they can do what you did. No matter how much you try and paint that moat of like, this is, this is foggy and weird and hard. It's not. Yeah. That's the disruptive mind, bro. Get out of the delusion. <laughs> I guess the, di the, the disruption could be perceived as confidence in delusion. It could. It uh, could. Because I'm going to take it to guitar. Yeah. I'm a B plus guitar player. If I, well, if, if I went on YouTube and tried to wreck myself in the middle of everyone that's on there, it's like, yeah, maybe B minus actually. Yeah. People that are in my immediate circle say, oh, Dylan, you're so good at guitar. Like, will you teach me? And I'm like, will you pick up a guitar for 30 minutes a day? Practice. 
and they're like, oh, I, uh, I don't know. And I'm like, I don't need a Tinchu Eite. You should pick it up 30 minutes a day. Tell the people the same thing about working out. They're like, oh, like, what do you do? Like, what do you take? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, can you show up to the gym five days a week? And they're like, what? I'm like, just do that. Yeah. If you, if you can just figure out how to just do that, like Pastor Dan was just the other day talking about being in proximity, but he was in proximity to Michael Bethany, how the spirit was there. And yeah. It's like, you know, if, if you're trying to get the, the skill or the spirit of working out or playing guitar or whatever, it's like, well, you got to be in proximity to it. You have to. You got to do it. If you want to get the skill of astrophysics, you got to read the freaking manual about astrophysics. That's it. Um, that's it. This is what I was going to go back to. Now I get it. We talked last time about Phil and Doug. They're basically, they're like metaphorical manuals for database and database management. Nobody reads those. <laughs> nope. Common problem. Yeah. Yes. I'm more mm-hmm. um, they just look at them as shiny things. Mm, yeah. Right? Like, oh my gosh, it's so great. So cool. But it's a shiny thing. Ask no questions. Nope. Don't read anything. Nope. But if they had a little bit of irreverence, they would at least dig in. Mm-hmm. and say, okay, why is this special? What makes you special? Yeah. I met with Glenn Benton last night. Okay. Told you a little bit about Glenn. He was telling me the story about how he had met this lady who was about 95 years old at Home Depot, and they ended up getting into a conversation about how her family helped develop a lot of dripping springs and like just got into all the sorts of details he also described how socially she was very different to interact with. Um, she was a little prejudiced towards the white people. She had, uh, she had other thoughts about people that live you know, farther east of us. And, um, and how she was also just more outspoken, like this little dog that was there and way of the line. She's like, I don't know why people, like, they're stupid little dogs. Dirty rat. Dirty yeah, I know the kind of people. Yeah. You know? so, oh. It was actually, she just couldn't see very well, but there was like a piece of debris next to the dog. She's like, that dog's shit in here. I can't believe it. And she starts talking to the owner. And the owner, he said, was maybe you know, 35 or 40, just like turned and looked the other way. You mean, just like, no. And, you can interpret it multiple ways. We don't have her side of the story, but it's like, clearly she didn't have a way to interact yeah. with that older lady. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe it was just like her way to interact. It was like, I'm not going to give that attention. I don't know. But um, we actually got into, you know, she was kind of a harder manual to read. Yeah. Um, you know, some books don't make as much sense to me because they're either using languages I'm not familiar with or a dialect I'm not as familiar with or yep. whatever. And so, um, doesn't mean I don't want to do it. If there's something I want to do, clearly I'll, like, I'll go read the manual. Well, you can't. So here's the other thing too, and this is going to be great. And this leads back to learning the guitar. Mm. Um, you can't just read the manual. Mm. You got to use it at the same time. Theory, no practice. Yes, exactly, exactly. Practice over theory, right? So here's my, um, and I've done this in practice. Here is my theory of how to learn things, okay? Um, have you ever talked with somebody who English is their second language? Let's say, let's say somebody who Spanish is their first primary language, English is their second language, and they don't speak English very well. Like, you can tell what they're saying, Mm-hmm. But the order of the words they say it in is like, that's not how you talk, bro. Mm-hmm. Um, in school, when we're taught languages, how are we taught languages? We are, maybe they show you videos and stuff, maybe. But most of the time, you're given a textbook. Here's some vocabulary. Here's how you structure a sentence. Mm-hmm. Here's how you put it all together. And here's how you say what you want to say. You know what we sound like whenever we take Spanish four and then we go to Mexico and try and speak Spanish to somebody? The exact way they sound like to us when they try and speak English. We sound like idiots. (laughs) That's because all we do is read the manual without any practice while we're reading the manual, right? They have to correlate. And the best example I have for this is tennis. So Adam Mars and I have talked about ways to learn and tennis is is a big one because he wants to learn tennis, his dad 
is big into tennis and, and he plays it. And we were talking about how you can't learn tennis by reading a book about how to roll, hold a racket and where to stand on the court and reading the rule book. You can, you can kind of learn what tennis is about, but you just learn the theory of tennis. You have to go play. And there's this idea, same thing with music, right? You can't learn music by learning how to read sheet music and learning what each chord is on the guitar. You gotta pick it up and strum it. So people think that you learn how to swing a racket by reading a book and then go play. How to, how to read music and then go play a guitar. Um, how to structure a sentence formally and then go speak the language. Totally opposite, totally opposite. What you do is you pick up the guitar and start strumming. You pick up the racket and start swinging and you immerse yourself in the culture and just start saying words back at people and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And then when you do that, you catch things. Oh, when I'm playing this, it sounds weird when I do this. Why does that happen? Oh, when I serve, the ball always goes this way. Why is that happening? Yeah. Oh, when I say this to this person, they look at me funky. Why is that happening? Then you turn to theory and say, okay, I have a specific thing in my practice that's messing me up. What in theory do they say about that? What can I learn? Okay, now I'll go apply that. I'll go adjust my grip. I'll, I'll change the, the way I'm, you know, whatever string I'm, I'm holding down on the guitar. Um, I'll change the way I'm grammatically putting the words together, right? So, yeah. so you let theory inform the places in practice where you see pain points, not just learn the theory and think you know it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That's learning through practice. That's what you've done your whole life. That's why, that's why I say you're a practical person. It's two things. Uh, one, go back to the Astro Dudes again. <laughs> yeah, hit it, then. hit it. What valuable skills did you learn in that process of getting like your degree and going and investigating astrophysics? There, there's good things came out of it. Yes. If it wasn't necessarily being smarter or a better astrophysicist, well, the first thing I got, right, the first thing I got is the irreverence. When I started looking and I was like, hey, you know, that guy got a whatever degree in chemistry. I know what that's like. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like that guy's not smarter or better than me at chemistry because of that. And maybe I have things that I can add that he doesn't know. Um, you lose a, what you do is you lose the fear of picking up any book and reading it. That's one thing, right? I have, I have no fear of picking up a chemistry book because I know that if I go in it and I practice the problems and I practice, you know, in real life even, right? If I go out and throw some chlorine in a, in a pool full of a bunch of um, mosquito larva and see what happens, right? I, I can kind of determine, I, this, that's silly. That's getting off a, off a, off a track, <laughs> of, right? What, yeah. what happens, but um, right, you can practice it. There's no fear. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only other things, man, I mean, so there's a practical skill. When you're doing astrophysics, you're learning a the theory, but you're also programming in Python. You're writing Python scripts. I learned how to code practically because, not because, you know, I was coding for somebody else or whatever, but because I was doing it for my homework, right? Um, I learned math and algebra. Maybe that's useful practically. I'm sure there are areas where it is. I haven't had to use it myself very much. Um, but that's, and that's what you practice, right? When you're doing astrophysics, you're not reading a Neil deGrasse Tyson book about all these fascinating things happening in space. No, you have a homework problem. You have to solve it by hand or solve it in a Python script. And that's what you're practically doing. That's what my skill set was coming out. Okay. That's it. The being out the left. The loss of fear and being able to pick up a book, any book, I think is great. Yeah. And I hear that could also be one of the reasons for institutional knowledge is developing confidence in people. Yeah. Taking them and guiding them from something from beginning to completion. So they like see and they're appropriately rewarded, like with an incentive structure, that's good for them. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
Now, the other pill that you can take in that situation is it's a form of brainwashing, which let me tell you what, we have some dirty brains. We could use some washing and cleaning up and reorienting, so it could be cool. Um, but what if school or higher education was less about the subject you study and more about developing someone who has the confidence and the skill to just complete things? Yeah. Not necessarily whatever that title is of their I completed college. Yeah, that would be disruptive. The idea of just picking something up and finishing it and, and completing it and gaining that lack of fear of going and doing it again. That would be huge. It's not what they do. Um, and well, because it, it kind of gives a lot of people, I think, an extra boundary where then they're like, if it's not this, I can't do it. Yeah. And people also, they're so domain dependent. Right. Have you ever heard funny jokes about being domain dependent about the guy who shows up for a business week long business trip in Vegas and he's got all of his luggage and he pays somebody to take his luggage to the room. And an hour later, you see him in the gym lifting weights. Right. So domain dependent yeah. um, or, you know, this uh, the or, or same thing like, you know, you see the guy at the work conference taking the escalator up to the to the third floor. And then 20 minutes later, he's on the treadmill in the gym. And you're like, what are you doing? Um, or even better, people, I think I've heard of this in New York, right? In New York, they have gyms that are two stories. I mean, there's an escalator that goes up to the cardio and you take the escalator to the cardio, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I mean, there's domain dependence here where, and this happens a lot in news, man. This is my biggest, and so I'm very irreverent about the news mm -hmm. because what people will do is let's say you are like me and you're a finance guy and you're into finance and investing. When I look at news on finance and investing, or even news in science and physics, I can look at that and say, a journalist definitely wrote that. They have no idea what they're talking about. They're so stupid. This is, this is wrong. Mm. And then I'm even prone to turn around and look at news in tech and be like, this is so profound. This is going to change the world. This is amazing. Wow. Mm. Whereas a tech person may be reading that news and be like, this is just a journalist writing this, this is stupid, mm -hmm. this makes no sense, this is crap, right? People are so domain dependent that they can look at things in their space and see exactly what's wrong in their space and where things are messing up in their space. Yeah. And then they assume all the spaces around them are perfect because they don't have the irreverence, right? right. We talked um, with some people on Wednesday and they were like, yeah, in my field, things are changing all the time, right? We're always disproving what we had before, but then they turn around and they trust chemistry and biology. And you're like, their field's the same way, bro. That's, mm -hmm. that's how it is. Um, and I think what's cool about physics is people count on physics to be the cornerstone bedrock thing that doesn't change. That's the absolute true thing. All these pseudoscience, psychology, all this stuff, yeah, that's going to change and be weird. But physics, no, it couldn't. And only when you're a physicist do you go through those programs and every class it's like, hey, yeah, I know you, we told you that that was like how this thing works, but actually we don't really know. Actually, that's not really how it works. Actually, you don't really know. <laughs> and by the time you get to the end, it's like, I, we don't really know much. Everything's kind of in flux. We're in the air where things are changing. And then you go, okay, everybody must be like this. That's, that's the irreverence right there. So who, someone's listening. It's like how, about to make this up. What would be a way to check your irreverence level, you think? How do you test your irreverence? <laughs> Um, I know. Okay. I know. How many thoughts do you have that are actually just recombinations of somebody else's thoughts? People don't test themselves on that. A lot of what I've said here, there's several things that I've said here that are thoughts of somebody else, mm -hmm. but there's a lot that I have too, right? A lot that I've, that I've said that's, that's, been molded into something. Mm. Um, okay. I love it. Gives me the opportunity to talk about a Netflix show, I think, that I found fascinating. As usual, I can't quote any of the movie <laughs> or, or, or even what show streaming Good. service it was on. That's because you're irreverent. You're not, you don't trust it because of what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. However, concept was very profound. There is a breakout of a virus. And the virus is spread by hearing it from some other person. Mm. 
Mm. And they call it like the gibberish or like the, the wow. one thing. And the way that they depict it on the show is it sounds like people are almost like, like the homeless schizophrenic people you will see on the street where they're just like, if only the triangles would all align and the color orange was more like number three, then we'd have a great blah, 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 blah. And every, so people are walking around with headphones on in the world so that they never hear those things. Cause if, as soon as they hear it, then you get it. And then you start spouting out the gibberish to whoever yeah. it is. That's the world today. It is. It back to our path of least resistance and how right now the easier thing is definitely to just say something that I heard some other smart person say, because whether, whether it's in context or not, I might just say it because like, you know, you said blue and I'm going to talk about blue origin spaceships now. What I said about Steve Jobs at the very beginning of this thing, mm -hmm. right? I said something by Steve Jobs. That automatically means that I think Steve Jobs has something important to say. It, it is a lack of irreverence towards Steve Jobs. Could have been an idiot. Mm. Who knows? Mm. I guess. Bad people can do good things. And dumb That's true. People can do smart ones and dumb people can quote smart people. And like, yep. You got you to gotta take that information and do with it. But that metaphor for news and for information for the regurgitation like reflex i think we have almost yeah um it's definitely strong today probably yeah. hard because we get a lot of input and we don't get to practice a lot of output or we don't get to practice as much output i think as we do you know what theory versus practice we get all the theory in and then we're like where we never apply anything we never, we never use anything so we're like where does this really belong yeah. Does this belong in conversations? Does this belong in just my personal introspection and like fixing my own head or yeah. in practice with people? Like, where does it go? Um, yeah, the, the regurgitation is huge today. I mean, and I don't know, man, there's testing the irreverence is hard and maybe testing the irreverence is all about, um, you know, do you believe science because scientists said it? Or you do you believe it because you know something about it, right? Like that's that's an angle you could take. It's same thing with economics and finance, right? Are you somebody who invests in a company because CNBC told you to invest in it, right? Or some guy on CNBC told you to invest in it? Mm. If so, you have no irreverence. We have not thought about that person, what kind of incentives they have, what how good they actually are, whether or not they actually own it, whether or not they're doing the opposite of you and selling it to you, mm -hmm. like. You know, if you are, if you are somebody who does not filter, does not have a filter on the information coming in from people around you who have a status about them, then you don't have the irreverence, right? And so I don't know how you test that. I don't know. I think you just know when you know, right? If you can yeah. look at somebody and be like, I don't trust you just because you're you. I think that that's probably the simple. The simple measure right there. Yeah. Do you have, do you have a thought process or do you just, do you even consider that it's not true? That not true. Do you even consider? Yeah. Do you even think about it? Do you ever Google the opposite of it? You know? Um, and there's a lot of people, right? That's this lack of irreverence is, I don't want to get so political into it, but it is why things are so binary in mm. the world today because I'm gonna to listen to my guy because my guy has scientists and smart people and money behind him. And the other person's like, well, I'm gonna to listen to my guy because my guy has money and smart people and scientists behind him. And nobody's actually thinking about what's being said. All they're doing is, is appealing to some higher authority, even though, what is that higher authority? Why, that, what do they have? What do they know, you know, so. So I, I encourage people to have irreverence towards me, right? Even that's why I don't like when people think I'm smart, say I'm smart, going way back to it, right? If you don't have irreverence towards me, then I have to finish every sentence with, but what do I know, right? Yeah. That way you at least get the idea of like, hey, I could be wrong. I feel like you also wouldn't get a lot of feedback, questioning or testing either, which never, he, yeah. So anyway, we can cut it there, but that is the, uh, I think that's a great introduction to the disruptive mind. Yeah. I agree. Cool. Nice. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> Let's reset, reorganize.